Let's just begin at verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we command not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Verse 15 is our focal verse tonight that we want to talk about. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. There are a lot of things in life uh, that, are, that are hard to understand. And uh, I think that sp spiritual things are, are some of those things that are hard to understand. Therefore, it's hard to comprehend that God created everything, but you can't help but believe that because if you look around you in the vastness of this creation, you know it had to be God. You know it had to be him that did it. And then, uh, you know, the God that before whom every king shall bow and by whom every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, that God gave his only begotten son uh, and he died for us. And it's hard to comprehend that and how as a result of all God has done for us, how we ought to live. Now, we can preach that. We can preach it in, in many ways. Uh, that's all we hear, or is what we should hear anyway, is, is that this very verse of Scripture, and, and you can look it up, there's very many more just like it, uh, where he died for all. And, that, and that's the whole story. If he didn't die for all, he didn't die for any. He wouldn't be God. And that's, that's the thing we've got to realize about God. God is righteous. God is absolutely, uh, when in the end of it all, he will use that same law to judge every one of us. We will, everyone, uh, be on equal footing before the Lord. And, and how, what we have done with all this is what, exactly what we're going to give an account for. And, that's, and those are the things that we need to know. Now, there is a hurried carelessness in our world today. I, I saw some pictures last night on the late news. I think they were from Minnesota. But they're having a, a rash of people being attacked, black people attacking white people. And they're knocking them out and knocking them unconscious, beating them up and, do, and robbing them. And they don't have enough police officers to respond in time uh, to get to these people. But they're catching a lot of them. But uh, see, you can see uh, the concept of lawlessness is already getting into our land. These these democratic controlled cities and mayors, they've, they've, they've run off the police. And so uh, when, when the police is gone, we're going we're gonna to be living in a lawless land. And, that, and, of course, when we're living in a lawless time, that's going to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because uh, we'll have exactly what we've got going on now. And so, uh, but... I've, I've, I've bought some uh, Bible helps to try to help me uh, to understand some things. But most of all, I, I just, I'm seeking the Lord to try to understand how in the world, in a time such as we're living in, how to better impact uh, the world that we're living in with the gospel. Because you know we've tried it and we've preached it on every occasion possible. Uh, we preach to the best of our ability that God did give his son. But that doesn't seem to... Uh, to pull people back from the wayward road, from the lawlessness of careless Christianity. And so uh, we, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. 
Uh, you know, there's, uh, so we tried to find a way to say it, but I think all we need to do is say it like the Lord said it, that he died for all. That he died for, he died for everyone, and that includes me and you, and that's what Paul is telling the church at Corinth. Now, if you'll back up, remember our lesson from, we, we were in Corinthians, and you remember in the first chapter, we talked about his praise and his commendation of these people. And uh, we know that it's scattered all throughout these letters. And there's a third letter of Corinthians that, that's not in the canon of scriptures here. But there's a third letter that he wrote to these people and, and still handling and helping them as a pastor and as a missionary and as a friend. He's still trying to help them and to point them uh, in the way they ought to go so that when it's all said and done, they'll be at the right place when they arrive. Uh, you know... Uh, uh, years ago and even today, sometimes boys, you know, boys will be boys, and some probably today girls involved in it too. Uh, but they'll turn road signs around, or they'll, they'll move one road sign for this road to a road that it doesn't really belong to be on. But used to in the West, they or in, they turned in signs a, a different way, and people would go the wrong way. It seems, seems to me like that uh, there's been a rush uh, by today's contemporary uh, preachers and the contemporary church, there's been a rush to find something that will be appealing uh, to different groups of the church by age. Uh, they're trying to find out how we can reach out and reach further. Instead, prayer used to be the vehicle that brought revival, but we're trying everything but prayer. I mean, if we do pray, we have a 10-minute prayer meeting and call that uh, a really burning desire for revival. And, and so that's, we're not going to get it that way. Uh, as much as we might want to try and much as we might want to think, uh, revival's not going to come that way. And so, uh, but Paul, uh, I want you to pay careful attention tonight at what he wrote in verse uh, 15 here, because that's what we're going to. It says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And so we know that uh, uh, one of the marked signs of the last days that men loved yourself more than they loved God. And so uh, we know that because that's what the Bible says. And we also know that when, when they were talking with Jesus about uh, when this time would be, that this day of the Lord, you know, we talk about the day of the Lord. Uh, when that day comes and what... What will, what will be a mark of this falling away, this, this time that's going to come when people will fall away? It will be men love themselves more than they love God. And that's, that's one of the, the key uh, indicators that, that we are in trouble. And, and when men love themselves, it doesn't matter what God says we ought to be doing. We're going to do what we want to do. And, and that's it. I mean... Uh, this thing began to fall apart in the 70s. Uh, it began to fall apart, and that's been a long time ago, I know, for some of y'all. Uh, but uh, even then, it, it was before then, but it, it really uh, became a very obvious thing, what was happening in the church in the 70s. And the church didn't know how to deal with it then, and they don't know how to deal with it now. And so then instead of uh, instead, you know, they're looking for a remedy. I can remember the words of the prophet, and the prophet said, is there not a bomb in Gilead? The bomb, of course, is that salve, that spiritual salve that say, my people are still sick, and uh, is there not a bomb in Gilead that, that you can put? And is there not a gospel today uh, in this time that we live that, that, the, that the people can be saved? And, and he said, the harvest is over, the summer is done, and my people still are not saved. And so uh, what we're going to do, we're going to, twice a year we make an a, a effort, not a concerted effort, but we do make some effort and, and have a, some, a preacher in here, and that preacher comes in here and tries to preach and to revive us up, uh, but it's not working. And so uh, what's it going to take to revive us up? Do you think if we lived unto God and not unto ourselves that we, would, we could revive again? You know, the prophet asked the question when he was looking over the Valley of Bones. What did he say? Can them bones live again? And then he began to preach that the, the bones began to form and the muscles and the things that which bound those bones together began to attach itself. And then the 
conclusion, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, them bones can live again. They were in bad shape. Uh, they were in the bone graveyard. But God energized them and brought them back again. Now, it's going to take a turning. It's going to take a turning, and, uh, and I don't know what that turning is. I, I don't know what it's going to take, but it's going to take a turning. And even with the turning, I don't know if that's going to help, but it's going to take a turning. Uh, because uh, people today live in sin and, and won't confess it. And, and they know they're wrong. And uh, most people I know will be honest enough to tell you, I know I'm wrong. But, so what you going to do about being wrong? Nothing. And so, and so there's, you have a part there. Uh, what we're going to do, and that's what exactly uh, the opposite of what Paul's saying to us. Uh, if he died for us all, uh, then... It's, it's to him that we present ourselves and, and we be the people that we need to be. Y'all, you understand that? I mean, if you really just, just take life. Just take, if you go in, uh, well, not today so much because of what I hear from, from employers. Uh, you used to, when a person was going looking for a job, they, they put on their best, they presented their best, they put their best foot forward. Now they could care less. They go in there all flopped up, nasty. I mean, just like, hey, man, you need me. No, 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 uh-uh. And that's exactly, I think, the way we treat God. We come in there flaunting ourselves and saying, you need me. No, he doesn't need us. This church is going to go without, without me and you. You hear me? The church that's in the world, the church of the living God, it's going to rain on because it's in God. But, but people will do that, and people will, I mean, uh, used to be when, when boys and girls were courting, I mean, they cleaned yourself up. They presented to the, to the potential mate the best side of them, even though later on when they found out the truth, they found out it was a pretentious thing. That's what's going to happen with the Lord. When his bride, he brings his bride up there, he's going to find out they were pretentious. And, and it's the same thing, never letting you, your husband see you, or your boyfriend see you with your hair down. Now, people today don't care. I mean, they'll show you what you, anything you want to see today. I mean, that anything goes today. So, it, I mean, we've lost all sensibility of, of doing our best, and you can see that in the church. You can see it being presented everywhere. And, and to, I can remember years ago, and y some of y'all might remember, we sent a group of people Michelle and Stephanie and some of them, I don't know who took them, but they took a, a group of our young people and went somewhere in Georgia and uh, to a thing that was for youth. Well, when, when our youth got home, uh, here's what they, what they did is they blasted them out with this hard rock music mess. They blasted them out with all that. And, and, and you know, and our youth said, we don't want to go back there. That didn't, Landon, were you in that group that went? That's what they said. They just didn't. They just didn't go there. That's not what we want. But that's exactly, uh, you know, what what is being presented now. That's exactly where we are. And so we we're trying to win them with everything but Jesus. We we've got to tell that story over and again, and people today don't want to hear it. And and you know you've got the challenge. You've got the challenge. I'll just be honest with you, hanging around with deadbeat people ain't going to get you nowhere. It just ain't going to get you nowhere. So in the end of it all, there, there's gonna, you're going to see this stuff, and you're going to see what you could have been. What could have been in your life, then you're going to see what you missed because of the choices and decisions you made. Because you made them choices and decisions based on your needs, and not the needs of the Lord through your life. You satisfied your need, but you didn't satisfy his need. You sought after everything but that. And you were convinced in your heart that you can't live without these earthly things or earthly people that, that has got you, you know, got your eyes whirling back in your head and you think you got to have. One day you're going to find out it's your Jezebel. It's your Delilah. It's your, it's the thing you didn't need. But you can't, you can't, nobody alive can tell you. 
Nobody alive. It's a, it gives me a nauseous feeling when I realize the people that are going to come to the end of the rope and realize that that rope is to hang them on. They didn't realize that down through the journey. But tell it, you can preach this message again Sunday morning and Sunday night. It's going to have the same impact it has the night. People don't want to hear it. They, their ears itch and they want to be tickled and told, hey, it's all right. I'll find another preacher to tell me what I'm doing is all right. Well, <laughs> go ahead. There's plenty of them out there that go right along with you. I'll tell you what you're doing is all right. But the, the apostle says he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Well, if we've been bought, Millie, with a price, then why are we playing the game of self? I mean, really? Can anybody answer that question? I mean, you get up every morning, you say, I'm not going to sin today. But how long does it take before you do? Your, your intentions are good. But there's a great big graveyard, and it's filled with good intentions. Yeah, that graveyard is full of people who had the best intentions, who were going to quit tomorrow, who were going to get saved at the next invitation that they didn't never get to hear. The graveyard is going to be full of people like that, it's people that say, I, I hate to go in the condition I'm in, who had the opportunity to come and go. So what's happening is, is the church is becoming co-conspirator with these people that don't want to hear, so they're closing the doors on Wednesday and Sunday night. They're providing every opportunity for these people not to hear by closing up the doors, by not being steadfast. They're providing every opportunity for people to, to just not hear the word because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. They won't hear it because they, the church is closed. They can't get to no place to hear it, generally speaking. And so y'all can see uh, when, you, when you, we analyze this and we're trying to analyze, I mean, I could really just throw, lay this Bible down over there, and I could go over there to John three sixteen that God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son, preach hell in heaven for the rest of the night we hear. And that's what really needs to be preached. The gospel of Jesus Christ is John 3.16. That's, that's really all that everybody needs to hear. They don't need to hear all this. I think, they think, they, they wrote a book about this and listened to Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so. Listen to Jesus. Because that's really the bottom line of it. Condemnation is that the light is coming to the world and men love darkness more than they love the light. If you can't get up there and preach on that, you ought not to be a preacher. If you can't get in your classroom and teach on that, you need to sit down and never teach again. That's what it's all about. We are trying to get this gospel light lit in the hearts of men to keep men from destroying themselves by loving themselves more than they love God. Amen? We'll, shrug, we'll come and sit in the church and shrug. Shrug it off. We'll put up with it for another Sunday. But I'm going to tell you, it ain't a putting up with. It's who we are and what we are. The poor man came to Jesus, couldn't even, run, even raise his head and look up because he was so ashamed of what he was. He was a sinner. He wasn't high and high-minded and proud. Don't strut like a rooster when there's sin all over your life. That's the whole deal of this whole thing called Christianity. Never before was it seen like it was seen at Antioch, and certainly not much since then. We hadn't had a great evangelist since Billy Graham telling you he was a great. I, I watched those old movies and I, uh, them old uh, crusade uh, tapes and I can't believe he was so full of fire as he was. I was reading just this week of how Elisha died and, and they threw somebody in there and buried him quick. They had to bury him quick and the fella got up. Couldn't, he could, he can't, he could, he, there was so much of God on Elisha even after he was dead and in his body. The anointing of God was so strong that he brought people back to life. How would you like to have a life like that? God's on you so strong that you have overcome them, little children. Because greater is he that's in you 
than he that's in the world. Y'all realize this stuff right here? Y'all realize how great this thing is that we're dealing with? People worried about who gets the atomic bomb, and I am too, nuclear bombs. Who's going to get them? Who's our... People worried about what the guy in Korea is going to do and the guy in Russia and the guy in Iran. I'm going to tell you something. They better be concerned about what the guy in heaven is going to do. Amen? I'm going to tell you all right now, it, them, them nuclear weapons are nothing compared to what's going to happen in the end of it all. God's going to take what men call power, and he's going to destroy this earth with the very fire from those nuclear weapons. Everything's going to melt. What could get that hot if it wasn't nuclear weapons? God's going to take the very things that men uh, have built and thought they were impenetrable and take them and use them to destroy this world that has stolen your love for Jesus. Stolen the commitment out of the church. And there ain't no need to talk bull. There ain't no need. I mean, we don't sit around and talk about Jesus. We sit around, smoke, chew, dip, talk about everything but Jesus. We sat around with a beer in our hand, sipping a beer, or sat around and know we're living in sin, and we don't talk about Jesus. We think about him maybe on our way to church, but the reality of it is, man, he's with you every, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's with us every minute, and we don't never talk about him. Don't, does that make sense to anybody? Does that make sense for anybody to live like that? And when you start thinking about it, a big part of what we do don't make sense. It's contradictory. I mean, do you live in a, a house that you know needs cleaning, but you go in every day and flop down and don't clean it? What in the world is wrong with you? We do, we do the same thing to God. He tells us our lives. He cleans us up. He washed, The Bible said he washes us as with hyssop. That, that soap, he washes it and gives us a new fragrance because if we're in Christ, we're a new creation. I, that's verse 17. And when you, when you start thinking about stuff like that, uh, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? It really makes you wonder. What in the world is is wrong with us but Paul's trying to convince the Corinthians you see we didn't come out of a, a, a background that these people came out of I'm telling you they, they worshipped idols and I heard some I preached somewhere and I don't even know who it was as we were listening on our travels today he was talking about the word idol and that's a and they had made a a, a thing out about what idols are idols prevent you from from God's love and that kind of stuff or God's leadership or something but talking about idols and what to do and our homes are full of them and our minds are full of them and and we on every hand we they're idols that lead us nowhere and if you know anybody that's a sinner the bible says if you would tell them you might save a soul from hell sometimes when we go home and and Miss Judy don't like for me to talk about her, but I'm going to say something about her tonight, and, and, and I hope she won't be too rough on me on the way home. But she said, Tom, I'm tired of hearing about such and such and such. I said, well, honey, who did God call to preach? Me or you? I got to preach what the Lord gives me. I know that you ain't just falling all over yourself when I'm up there and God's filling me and, and sending me the word about the sin that's in this church and in people's lives. I know I don't see a lot of shouting going on. So I figured out that people ain't really enjoying it. Amen? But look here. It's like the fellow in revival. <laughs> we need you to come, brother, but we don't want you to come. It's that kind of thing. We don't want you, but we need you. Our church needs you to come, but we don't want you. And that's exactly what it is. We, we, we will gladly take the Lord's healing. We will gladly take the Lord's working us through a problem. We will gladly uh, uh, take everything he wants to give us, but we won't, don't give him back anything, including ourselves in our life. Uh, we don't, our time is limited that we can 
uh, rendered to him. Can I tell you something? Your job tonight ain't more important than Jesus Christ. You may think it is, but it is not. And when that job interferes with him, it becomes an idol. I've been reading in the Old Testament. I, I want to read to you sometimes. They did good according to the, the former king, but they didn't tear their idols down. They didn't tear down the high places. Therefore, I mean, all that good they did was killed off when they didn't tear down the high places. Amen. And so that's it. That's exactly what it is. And so that, that's where we are. And I was listening to uh, EWTN on radio uh, today when I was riding, and that's a Catholic network if you don't know what that is. It's a Catholic network, and this, this priest came on there, and he said, we received a, a letter from the Holy Father, which is the Pope. And he instructed us for the next four years to look at the Trinity, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and then the Trinity itself. And he says uh, he'd been in the, in the ministry 70 years. But he said, I learned something in going back through uh, the this Holy Spirit, what being the Holy Spirit and his role in our life today. He said, I learned. He's been a, a father, a priest for 50 years of his life. And so I, I just want to tell you something. The Holy Father has a home in Rome. Our Holy Father has a home in heaven. But what the Holy Father in Rome said meant more than what the Father in heaven said. You see? And that, that's, that's exactly... Y'all... You're picking up the pieces of this. That's exactly uh, how are we going to work on it. How what are we going to do? I mean, somebody points out all the time. This is a volunteer base. We work voluntarily in our churches, right? Most the people do. The, the pastor usually is paid. Generally, he's the only one unless it's a larger church. But most other people workers are volunteers. And so, uh, if you've got volunteers, but you know, really, they're not volunteers. Because they stepped up and said, we've been called by God to do this. You're no longer a volunteer. You are called to do what you're doing. And therefore, we have an expectation because you've been called by God to do the work of this church. There's an expectation we can demand because you said you were called and you believed that God called you and led you led you here that gives you an ultimate responsibility right there in and of itself and so he says in our life listen to this so henceforth that means from now on from now on we have you know we sh we live un unto not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again so now we live for God we live for Christ and, and some of y'all, has any of y'all seen that, that new spiritual movie that's had that Christian movie, Overcomer? Well, you'll like it when you see it. I won't tell you. I won't go anywhere. But I, I want, on the surface of it, I just want, I want to tell you this. People becoming aware of Jesus Christ in their life makes them an overcomer. And I bl honestly believe that no matter uh, the hardships that you've suffered in life, the places that you've been, what you're going through right now, I think when Christ finds his proper place, you'll be an overcomer in your lives. I think that your life will so drastically change uh, that you won't believe it. So I, I would very, I'd recommend, I don't, I'm not a movie buff and all that, but I'd recommend you see that. Uh, because it's, it is a Christian movie. And I'd recommend you see uh, how they became overcomers, and it's about Christ. And, and there's so many people out there that, uh, that don't, their lives have been full of chaos, and they've been lied to. Uh, they've been led uh, by people in the wrong direction. And then when they, 
all this stuff comes full front and they find out the lies that have been told, it, it, it has a, an impact. Amen. And that's, those are the kind of things that we need to be aware of. When you can find out the lies that Satan has told you and you believe them, I'm going to tell you something. That's what happens when you come to Jesus. You realize you've been lied to. You realize that you've been, that Satan has cheated you out of so many riches and things that the Lord had laid up in store for you. And, and the church is going to come to her end. And if you read them, they're right there in Revelation. Jesus covers every one of them. What the devil done in the church. There was one who, who appeared to be alive, but they were dead. That's what the scripture says. There was one that left its first love. There were those that, that hung on tooth and nail to, to a false doctrine. Tooth and nail. But yet they believed it. They brought in this stuff into the church. It, those kind of things that are just overpowering and overwhelming. They got tangled up out there and couldn't get back to where they needed to be. What happens to people, and I've heard people have told me this, they're embarrassed to come back. Why? Do you think the prodigal boy was embarrassed to come back? He might have been. He, might, he said, I'm going, and I know that if he don't accept me, I deserve not to be accepted, but in my father's house, I'm treated better than, as a servant than I am where I'm at. And so, and he came back to Christ, didn't he? He came back to the father. And sure enough, in the coming back to the father, we, we all know uh, at what rejoicing that brought. Now, what I want us to do for the rest of the time I'm not going to shoot no bull with you. Where are we, this whole crowd right here? Them that's upstairs, them that's in the hallway out there. Why are we playing this game? When are we going to give it all to him? God ain't saving nobody. It's because we ain't doing what God said to do to be saved. These churches around here, 25,000 a year, zero baptisms across the country, or more, probably more than that. How many hundred close up every year? It's because they went out there and started something God had nothing to do with. I don't even know if we're going to, you know, our revival brother Randy kind of intimated to me that he probably wouldn't be able to come because of his health. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to do something. But what? How are we going to reach a bunch of people that won't want to be reached? How are, you going, how are you going to encourage people to come to church? If their car was sitting out in the yard with a flat tire on it, they knew exactly what to do. I mean, if their wife left them, went and got a lawyer and sued them for half or more than everything they got, they knew exactly what action to take. But we don't seem to know what to do when we divorced the Lord and left him standing. Don't you think he kind of lets us know what it feels like to be left at the altar? Hello? Don't you think that we're getting a taste of that in the environment now of what he went through when, when we forsook him? That's that thing I told you, everything is going to come back. There, that law of reaping and sowing is going to pour right back in on you. You will reap, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for what a man sows he shall reap. Are you listening to me? To reap. A house can sit alone and hit a rot down for God's sake, so I don't know why. You can take a brand new house, build a brand new house, and let it sit. And, and the sheetrock will start to crack in it. And it eventually it'll get a crack and it'll fall apart. A brand new house. But you can fill it with the voices of little boys and girls. And man, it just seems like it expands the walls. Tell Somebody explain what happens there. You 
in him was life. And when that life's in us, we are the same way them little boys and girls are in that new home. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. We make that home. The home doesn't make us. We make the home. We put the life in the home that keeps it, you know. Care. It's about care and maintenance. It's, that's what it's all about. And so what happens in our life is the care and maintenance has been let go, and we're, we're falling apart. Spiritually speaking, ladies and gentlemen, y'all know what I'm talking about. We have te technology today that's finally proven everything that the Bible says about God. Not who he is, but he's everywhere. He said there's no place you can go that I'm not. That's, how, that's what I am means. So as big as this universe is and big as this world is, he's in every place in it. The psalmist said, I can't, I can't go anywhere and not find you. You're everywhere I go. If I were to ascend, if I were to descend, thou art there. It, look here, there's not a place on this earth that a satellite can't reach you. Can't reach the, the, the things that have been put in your automobiles and your cell phones and in some cases put in people's bodies. There's nowhere you can't be reached. That's why now, sooner or later, they'll find where you last appeared if somebody kills you and they'll find you eventually. Throws that, that tracker away. And eventually... They're going to sell this, this thing that they're going to put in you, and you know what that, that's about, and, and they're going to be able to track you everywhere you go and everything you do, and they got an account of everything you've ever sent on your computer, your cell phone. they got a record of it somewhere, and I hope you're proud of everything you've ever sent because there's a record. But more importantly, I want you to know God knew the record before they ever recorded it. And it's to him that we will give an account. You can gossip on a cell phone. It's still the sin of gossip that will send you to hell. Gossip is a sin. Maligning others on a cell phone is just as much as standing to their face and, and lying about them and, and gossiping, backbiting. Jesus said unto them, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. You wash everything. On the outside, you look perfect, but on the inside, you're as nasty and dirty as you ever were. You'll travel the world over to proselyte somebody and then make them more times the devil than you are. We drag them, and we, can, we come. And, I, and I'm just going to tell you all something. If you happen to mention anything, uh, you know, sin, you, if you're forgiven of sin, it don't matter what sin was, you forgive it. If you're, I mean, if you ask God and you ain't playing no turkey games with him. You're forgiven. But over there in Leviticus, and I know that's the old law where he talks about cutting ourselves and writing on our bodies and all that stuff. It's as plain as day over there. I see people that start here, go to their neck with tattoos all up and down their body. That is not of God. Now, I don't care how many of them old laid-back preachers you're listening to on Facebook that says it's all right. If you got them before you got saved, there ain't nothing you can do about it but get them off. But if you keep on getting them, you're disobeying God. Now, if you don't like that, pull your tattoos off and get out of here. That's the Bible, and I'm not going to apologize for what God said. It also says don't cut your body and put cuttings all over your body either. It also says that. It, all, it says do, don't do a lot of things, so quit doing a lot of things. Quit doing this mess that you know you ought not to be doing. Quit going where you know you ought not to be going. Quit thinking what you know you ought not to be thinking. And, and for one time in your mind, say, God, what would you have me think? What would you have me do? Lord, help me to be what Paul said I need to be. A living vessel unto you, everything is important in my life. Everything rose from the dead. I'm alive. Wherefore, henceforth, no, we know man after the flesh. See? And that's where all that stuff goes. I can't help but get excited about this stuff. I can't even help but ask myself what we're going to do. 
I mean, that little, that little thing over there, we're going to keep it up there, but it's just, a, it's just a reminder of how callous and careless we really are. Because I happen to know, I, I've seen y'all go other places and you had all kind of friends with you, but you can't bring them here to Sunday school. You haul people that you don't even know up and down the roads to other things. Where are they at in Sunday school at New Horizon Church? When you were here, you can haul them all over the country, but you can't bring them to church. What's the deal? Can't even hardly get our youngins to come no more. If they do, they drag in at 10, 30, 11, 30 and call themselves coming to church. What's happened to your youngins? You, well, they got 17 or 18. You said they're on their own. Hey, you need to get a bigger board is all you need to get. Take away their car, take away their truck, take away their phone, take away everything they got until they know what's important in their life. Stop feeling sorry for your children. That there's nothing about them to feel sorry for. They live like kings. Stop treating them like kings. Start treating them like a child that's in need of help. They won't never know what's important until somebody stands at the door and says, here's what's important in our house. That's what Joshua did. Me and my house are going to serve the Lord. And that's it. You get It takes hard love sometimes. It takes hard love. It takes coming to church when we got aches and pains. But I, I'll just tell you right now, we're going to have to overcome that stuff. We're going to have to overcome it. it. This is important. And we're going to have to decide what we're going to be from this day forward. And a number ain't, ain't really what's important, other than the fact that it tells the story of how unprepared we are. It's just like you can say Billy Graham said that 85% of church members are lost. How does he know? I mean, he's a good man, traveled all over the world, but he don't really know that. But he's basing that on the fruit that he sees in people's lives. And that's what the Bible says, you'll know them by their fruit. A lot of people say amen because they, they see it happening. But here's what they don't see. That mirror's got somebody else in it instead of them. Them are the problem. The thems are the problem. Them are the problem. It's like the preacher and the man by herself. They were having revival. One man came. Preacher preached, and the man said to the preacher, preacher, if they'd have been here, you sure preached to them. You see, that's, a, that's exactly the way we feel. Some of you are saying, well, preacher, I don't, I don't sin. Well, right there in and of that, you've made God a liar. That's what John said. When you said that, you, God, you, you might as well say, God, you're the biggest liar I've ever heard. Because God said every one of us sinned. All of us need a Savior. None of us are worthy in righteousness. So don't put yourself over there in that righteous uh, caboose and think you ain't got everything set up and ready. You're not. Old people sin. Young people sin. Probably the biggest thing old people do is nothing. When God said that old people ain't supposed to retire with him, you keep on working. Wear yourself out instead of drying up amen i try to tell my friend fred fred don't sit over there in that chair until you get so stiff you can't walk if you do you won't be able to walk and you'll sit over there in mealy mouth and be sorry for yourself when you can get up and just get something going in your life to strengthen your muscles up now i told him to his face not talking to his back and i said it'll help you because I can sit in my house for a day, and I can, I'm telling you, stuff starts tightening up in my legs, and, and I'm not but 35. I, mean, I was born in leap year. But, see, I'm in trouble right here. But you know what I'm talking about, right? So I just want to ask you, if somebody responds, Millie, what are we going to do? Based on where you live, based on what's going on in your life, based on your own personal beliefs and commitments, what do you think is going to happen if we don't change? Not based on something that you've heard, but something you honestly believe. What's in, because you see it. 
You live around it. You hear it. I mean, what's going to happen if something don't change? The revival will break through in our lives. You're going to lose. And it's it getting easier all the time. To, you know, yeah. Okay, that's a good, honest answer. Someone else want to respond? Jennifer, uh, based on where you live and your relationships, what is your opinion about uh, what, what are we, what's going to happen? What are we going to do? This is your answer, so it's, it's not a right or wrong. Nobody lives in your world but you, and, of course, the clothes slam you around you. So, but you have a perspective because I've heard you share it, and I know you do, so <laughs> put it on us. Somebody else want to share? From where you are, from your perspective. Somebody else want to share? We tried this side. How about over there? Somebody want to speak up? Just personally, I think I need to work on my spiritual. And what makes you think that? I mean, uh, not trying to pry, the, <coughs> but what makes you feel that way? What is it that draws your attention? Yes, I can't get more honest than you just were. Uh, and and uh, that's, if you and get. It bothers me. It does. It really bothers me. But at times it's like I don't care. Well, what you need to do is wherever you are, just fall on your face somewhere. Get, get somewhere in a private place and just fall on your face before the Lord. And, Lord, what would you have me do? I, I, you know how I feel. You know the unworthiness is in my life. You know I'm, I'm as Mean is the devil, and and I need to change that. How do I change that? And and really, that's that's the, that's what we do. We can change our environment. We can change it when we turn to God. We can change who we are. But if you keep hanging out, it's not going to work. It's exactly right. It's not going to work, and so. But you're, you're this much taller than it because you realize what you need. Like Most people don't realize it. And like I told Bernie, I've come a good long way in the last year, but it's still taking some work. Yeah, man. Yeah, you got a lot to do. But, but God has done the work. You've got to learn to live in the shadow of the cross. And that's doing what he says do. That's working in the past. That's right. Past ain't got no control over you. That's exactly right. That's it. You got it. You're on the right road. Just keep going. And before you know it, you'll be talking yourself right out of the hole you've been. Someone else? And, and believe it or not, right now in my own personal life, I'm dealing with some things. I mean, they're not, they're not going to make or break, but I'm dealing with some things about people, about things, about what's going on, not in this church, but in my life and, and 
how am I going to handle that and how am I going to deal with it? And, and so how the outcome is, is, is really going to is important to me in my life. Probably nobody else will be affected by it but me. But it's very important in my life, the outcome of it. So I'm wrestling with stuff too. Maybe it's different than what you are. But the truth of it is what you said. What's my role? Yes, sir. It's, it is. It, it may not be tomorrow, but it is. And I've, you probably heard somebody talking about that and say that, right? Mm. And, and so that's, that's where it's coming from. But it is literally going to come to an end. But not yet. Jesus said not yet when men are talking about it and all this stuff. Let's, except there come a great falling away. And that's what we've been talking about. And, and when you get a little older and you yourself, you become immersed in the Word and in the Spirit of God, you'll understand what that means it's coming to an end. Some people, it's already come to an end, but they're still walking around. They don't know that their life has come to an end because they have rebelled and turned against God so long. Uh, that they don't know that their life is already over. They're just waiting to, you know, thank you. Anybody else? Here's what, I, I would really love to have revival. I mean, I'm talking about personal revival, if not corporate revival, church revival. But you know, here's the thing. Revival is not dependent on the speaker. Revival is dependent on us. If we will come to realize that, but like my sister right there just said, and, and, and I, I chimed in with it, but like what... When we come to realize the thing that, that we thought was, was right is getting wider and wider and wider, but the problem's been us. You know what would be a great benefit to America if every mirror was broken? You didn't get that, did you? That's a deep thought right there. <laughs> if every mirror was broken, we'd stop looking in a mirror dimly and we'd have to look face to face well take our church our church has to do a lot of spanking people or whipping people the word we have to you know teach and preach the preaching and Paul calls that real, to rebuke really, rebuke you know, direct yeah correct teaching. but in most churches, they say they're not doing that, that they're coming to worship. Well, we are to come to worship to this church in the sanctuary. We're supposed to be worshiping in here. But we have so many people uncommitted, and their lives are on and off until they have to be spanked all the time. So we have to go through spanking with all the people. But we've turned our church time from studying the Bible and worshiping supposed to praise him, worship him, and love to that's the setting in most of the churches. So we have people that say they're worshiping but they're really saying they're not. It's like an emotional move and they leave the church and they're right back where they were to start with. But then you take some churches they're spanking people all day long you know, when they're together and so they're not worshiping. So. Well, uh, the Lord went and wrote to Timothy to do to use rebuke and correction. He said that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp and into it. It's sort of good for doctrine, correction, and right so on and so forth. And, and I don't call it whipping somebody all the time. Now, what needs to happen is these churches that are telling you how worshipful they are, they're the ones that need some rebuke. Because I know how them churches live. I know there's people there. I know a lot of people in these big churches that, that are living, drink, carouse, run around with somebody else's wife. Their young ones are rebellious and out of control, dope heads and everything else. 
And look here. But they hide it up there under some big banner of the, of the Baptist church here and the Baptist church there. But they're living like hell because that preacher ain't got the courage to stand up there and rebuke with the word of God. And that's it. And so I'd rather have a crowd here that, that we, can, we can correct. We were never set here to become a mega church. We were set here to reap into the drug addicts, the prostitutes, the dopey, whatever you call it. We were, here, we were sent here to help the people that need help because other churches would not help them. And William told me that he'd been to places and they, and you know, I mean, just think about other people have been, they weren't wanted there. I mean, Tabor City doesn't have a bit of confidence in you, Jonathan. They see you all up and down the streets up there They in the past. They relate everything to your past for that. And so you, you, got a, you got a thing to overcome, but you don't have to overcome it. Jesus has already overcome it. I mean, you're the one that avowed that you were a homosexual. They didn't do it. You've got to prove that you're not that because homosexuals is an abomination in the sight of God. Well, you ain't no struggle to it. You either give it up or, you, or you're walking against God. There ain't no decision to make there. There ain't no decision to be make about premarital sex. It's all the same. It ain't just yours is worse than hers or his or mine. It's all sin. And that's why we're here. We're here to receive the people. The harlot washed Jesus' feet with her hair. She, she had seven demons at one time in her, and she came and washed his, his feet with her hair, brought him a bottle of ointment that was very expensive. And she, that's the one that they accused Jesus of having an affair with, Mary Magdalene. Well, don't. Quit trying. No, I did. You, don't try. You can't fix it. Jesus, Jesus fixed it. But here's the thing. Uh, you know, you uh, you can't you got a Facebook page and you go on there and post all kind of dirty stuff on there, language and everything else. What are they to expect? If you is there a change come over you? If they were, you wouldn't be doing that publicly where everybody can see it. See, that's the whole thing. That's what people do. They they get on Facebook and I'm I'm just using you and I'm not trying to embarrass you. We're just facing the truth. People will get on there and they talk all kind of smack. And then the next thing on the next page, they want to somebody please pray for me. Let's, let's get to Jesus over here. Why weren't they living for Jesus two or three pages ago back there? That's what I'm trying to tell you. We live for the moment. It's easy for me to be worshipful right here in New Horizon Church. I asked, by the way, I, this is so blessed. I, this is a blessing to me. I, I said, Cullen, what church do we go to on the way over here? He said, New Horizon. And I said, who's your pastor? He said, Peter Tom. <laughs> Tell you. Two little fellas, two years old. Peter Tom. And he didn't say Papa. <laughs> you know what? He's heard somebody say Preacher Tom. But he, he picked it up that Preacher Tom is his pastor. Amen. Ain't that sweet? I think it is. But when you think about all that stuff, see, they put the bad mouth on me too, you. In Tabor City. They do it. Have done it. But that, that don't bother me one iota because I know who I am. That's my problem. I love people that they know who they are. <laughs> I know who I am. But, hey, they're the ones that's going to reap the stones falling on them, not me. The Bible said if you do it to the least of these, my children, and I'm the least, you do it also unto me. I'm the least. I, I feel like I'm the least. But they can run their mouth. I know what the truth is. And it seems like when people run these lies right on and right on and right on, I know where I live and I know what I think and what I do. And I'm very ready to give an account of it. Under the blood of Jesus. Mother's Day 1971. I'm ready. So... Bring it on, Jonathan. Bring it on, son. That's what I'm telling you. But for God's sakes, when you go out there, walk straight. Whatever you say you are, be whatever you say you are. Walk straight. They won't have no reason to criticize you. Well, I remember that boy was, and here's what I'm going to say. I know what he is now. See, that's what God says. 
I don't, I don't care what you've been. And you shouldn't care what I've been. But I do care who you are today and what you represent. Because you come out here and say you are a member of this church. That's what I'm telling you. And so that's, that's what I say we need to do. We, that's, what, that's what brings revival. As most people won't talk as openly as you do. And so we can't have revival because they don't. Well, just, if it's wrong, don't do it. I mean, you get upset, you just can't go running that raw mouth. Don't let that mess pour out of your mouth just because you got an upset. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself when they, people see that sewage spilling out of you. That's what it is. It's spiritual sewage. And you can't convince a man that you're doing anything right when that stuff's spilling out of you. So that's where, that's, that's where you and God are going to work it out and change it. That's when you're going to be having revival. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly it. And you're old enough to reason that out. Take your Bible and sit down and read. And, and, and I don't want to tell you all anything, but that movie that this person gets to, they take the Bible and sit down and realize who they are. And when you realize who you are, It'll change everything in your life. It's there, huh? That's exactly right. Nothing. You become a winner, a victor in Jesus Christ. We, it's 8.30, but that don't matter. Anybody else got anything to share? I have one other thing, if y'all don't have anything. Any questions about our lesson?